Welcome to the Choose FI Radio Podcast, Episode 21, The Pillars of Fi. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. All right, guys, we're back. And today, as usual, we're talking about financial independence. You know, this thing, it's really easy, but it's also incredibly difficult. It's simple, yet incredibly complicated. It can be distilled into a couple bullet points or expounded into a library of books and hundreds of new websites every day. But we're going to try and go through some of the bullet points today in this episode, which we're calling the Pillars of Phi. So Brad's here with me in the studio today. Welcome, Brad. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm glad to be here as always. This should be a, a fun one. I think uh, the Pillars of Defy is is a really good overview podcast that we can really touch on. You know the, the main aspects of financial independence, and uh, yeah, hopefully we we captured as many of the important ones as you know as we could come up with. And you know, as always, we we love the feedback from the audience. So if you guys have any that we missed, you know, send it to us uh, in an email. Feedback at choosefi.com. Or, you know, leave a comment on this post. Uh, It'll be at choosefi.com forward slash zero two one. You know, this episode is is a high level picture. And I think it's cool that we're doing it as episode 21 instead of episode one, because so many of these we've actually fleshed out now. And we'll kind of point you to those specific episodes as we go. But we're going to go kind of high level. We're going to pull a couple of these pillars out. And then at the same time, while we're doing it, we'll try to point you to the ones that we've already done so you can go and get more information about each one of those. And then we'll also tell you when the other ones will be coming up. So, uh, you know, I was listening to this uh, to this podcast the other day, this personal finance podcast, and I'm not going to name it, but they were kind of going through some basic, you know, kindergarten stuff about just doing a budget and kind of, you know, why debt is bad and all that sorts of thing. But I love our podcast and I love our community. I love the ideas that we're really going through one by one because it's next level stuff. You know, it's essentially the guaranteed path to wealth. There's no really unknowns or uncertainties built into this. We're not we're not building a bunch of really high flying techniques that only the select few has access to. Almost anybody can use the techniques that we're talking about. And we're just trying to show you how to get started. And so when the feedback comes to us and basically says, I've listened to 17 episodes and I've made one actionable step from each one of those. You know, you your life is going to be so much better as a result of those changes that you've made. This isn't like sending you to go get the lottery ticket or trying to send you down some rabbit hole where you don't know what's happening. The math works for you, as we say over and over again. So today what we're doing is just going through kind of one by one some of these things that that people in the fire community, they all have in common. They've, they've done these in one shape or form. And Frankly, you know, after this episode, we could probably all just stop, right? Nothing else needs to be said about any one of these where where it's it's, it's all over. Um, And obviously that's not true. But today is just a fun look at what those individual levers actually look like. And then hopefully pointing in the direction where you can get more about each one of those if that's something that you're interested in following. So, uh, Brad, you ready for this? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So these are in no particular order. uh, But number one, we thought we would talk about uh, low cost index fund investing. Yeah, this is a crucial one. There's no doubt about it. We talked about this with Jim Collins in episode 19, and we also, you and I talked about it in episode, way back in episode three. Uh, you know, we believe that low cost index fund investing is the absolute way to go with investing in the, in the stock market and growing your wealth over a period of decades. Sure, there's a small chance that you could outperform the market with your own stock picking genius, or maybe you found the one mutual fund investor who actually can outperform over the course of, you know, four or five decades. But the likelihood of that is extremely, extremely slim. And, you know, you're, you're going to pay a significant amount in fees for, for that potential, right? Which is a very, very small, small likelihood of, of, of that positive outcome. So for us, the more prudent choice is, 
invest in the market, invest in, you know, in, in the case of VTSAX, the total U.S. stock market index fund, you're buying a tiny little piece of every U.S. company, every publicly traded U.S. company, and you're paying a tiny minuscule fee to do so. You know, with Vanguard, it's it's 0.05. And, you know, so we've seen Charles Schwab came out with an even smaller expense ratio. So, so this, in our opinion, is is the absolute best way to invest, and it and this does seem to be a pillar of FI that you've heard over and over again. Again, the you know the mad scientist when he was on in episode seventeen, he said that you know when he first started investigating FI, he thought for sure that through the course of you know tons of research and and work that he could outperform the market, and he very quickly came to the realization that that was not the lever that he wanted to pull. You know, for him, it was tax optimization, and we will talk about that later. But, you know, that just just goes to show that, you know, even the smartest people around, even someone like Brandon, just realized that it was a fool's errand to try to outperform the market. I think it always takes a little bit of humility to come to that point, because I think part of it is just as a person, maybe as a guy, I don't know, but you just feel like I'm going to learn the secrets to beat this thing. And it actually is probably what holds you back. Because you're very quick to acknowledge your successes and marginalize your failures. But it's crazy to me that what probably seems like the most complex thing is actually one of the simplest. It's probably out of all these things that we talk about, my investing strategy is probably the thing that I put the least amount of thought into. I'm just doing low cost index fund investing. I've done it. So a lot of initial research. I've made my decision on that. I don't second guess it. There's there's no other real information that, that I need there. I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm putting my stuff in Vanguard, you know, whenever possible, low cost index funds. And then I just don't watch it. And I fully expect, you know, essentially what, do you, what is it that you always like to tell me, wake up in 40 years and ask for your cardiologist. Because, <laughs> you know, I mean, it just, there are other tools that we're going to talk about that you will use, but from an investing perspective, when there are hundreds of TV shows dedicated to it, hundreds or thousands of magazines dedicated to it, stock tips, you know, Kramer and Mad Money Magazine and all these other things, all these flashy bells and whistles, I just ignore it. I'm just doing low cost index fund investing. And it's just the simplest thing in the world. And we can just move on. I mean, really, it is just that simple. Yeah, agreed. And and just a, an addendum to this, this pillar is actually not timing the market. It, it kind of goes hand in hand with, with low cost index fund investing is, you know, you can't, outperform the market in all likelihood, and you cannot time the market. It's just, it is almost impossible to do. And I mean, you have to be right. You have to be right twice. You have to be right on the selling side and on the buying side. And that's, it's just so, so unlikely. So, you know, again, our strategy, which works for us both mathematically, we believe, and psychologically, certainly is to just keep pumping money into low cost index funds as often as we possibly can, don't, you know, look at the market. Don't like Brandon from the mad scientist joked on his episode. He, you know, looks for the, the fund price to be his hockey number or something crazy like that. You know, like the, we, we let our brains screw us up and you just, this is an instance where you just can't just put it on autopilot, let it roll and, you know, wake up in 40 or 50 years and, and, you know, have more money than you could possibly, possibly imagine. All right. The second pillar that we're going to go over today is affordable housing. So this is one that when you screw it up, it's really, really hard to dig your way out. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I mean, it's it is a huge line item in your budget and, you know, buying intelligently or or renting, as it may be, is just so crucial. I mean, I know we talked about this with Chad Carson on house hacking and that's something that Jonathan, you and I both wish we could go back and, and do over if we could if we could be, you know, 22 again, Definitely. without a doubt. But, you know, there are ways to be to be intelligent with your housing and just just like everything with Phi, and, and we will talk about this at the end of the episode is it's just thinking a little bit differently. All right. So, you know, this this is not to say that someone in a high cost of living area, someone in New York City or San Francisco can't pursue Phi. You know, we're not arguing that at all. It's not, you know, move to Richmond, Virginia or Wichita, Kansas, and that's the only way to reach Phi. It's it's just it's being a little bit smarter and just being cognizant of of where your money's going. And I think, you know, housing is, is certainly a huge aspect of that. It, that might mean if you live in one of those high cost of living areas, think differently and get a get a roommate or 
rent out a room or or something like that or maybe go slightly further away from your job and find something that's that's a little more reasonable you know that might go against you know what mr money mustache would say which is you know live close to your job and and bike but but you know we're not making any kind of proclamation here on what you have to do precisely it's just think a little bit differently and i know you know in my own life we we lived my wife Laura and I lived on Long Island, New York our entire lives and you know we came to the point where we were get, getting married and we realized that we were going to have a very difficult life there on Long Island and that's even as you know two CPAs making a you know a decent living uh it just wasn't practical for us just because the housing prices were crazy i mean our friends were spending 400 plus thousand dollars on fixer uppers with $12,000 a year taxes. I mean, that's, that's crazy. And, you know, our entire mortgage payment now, including principal interest and taxes are less than what our friends pay just in taxes. Wow. And that, yeah, I mean, and, that, and that's no joke. I mean, that's, and for living in one of the nicest parts of the Richmond metro area in a four bedroom house with a, a yard. I mean, you know, this was a, a tough decision that we had to make, but sometimes pursuing five requires tough decisions. So, uh, you know, that's kind of my more philosophical look at, at housing. And I'd be curious to hear what you think, Jonathan. I agree with you. So I think the conversation is different in the fire community. When you go and, and you're trying to, let's just say you're just average Joe Schmo and you're looking for your fo- first house, the, the house that you buy is just a function of your income. You go to the bank and they say, okay, you make a hundred thousand dollars a year. You can get approved for a $600,000 mortgage. Okay, great. Right. In our community, like I could get, I could get a much larger mortgage than, than what I have currently. I could, I could afford, or, and I say afford with quotes <laughs> around it. I could afford a much larger, or much more expensive home than I'm currently in. But that's, that's not the way our brains are wired because we're pursuing fire. It's a, it's a function of the math. And, you know, you can go much deeper with this. We're in this particular episode, we're just talking about affordable housing as a function of of uh, as a tool that allows you to reach fire faster in episode i think we're going to do it episode 23 which is going to be two episodes from now we are going to actually dig in to renting versus buying it's a huge debate on the internet especially in the fire community uh jim collins and go curry cracker and christy from millennial revolution are heavily in the rent camp and there are plenty of other people that are in the buy camp and we're going to kind of play devil's advocate because both Brad and I are homeowners, but Brad is a firm believer in renting and I'm a firm believer in whatever the math says, but at the same time I get the emotional connection to the home. And so uh, we're going to have fun with that episode and go through all their arguments. And then we're going to go through the straw men and then just kind of come up with some sort of answer, but that that's coming in episode 23. But for the sake of today and this little short analysis, my big thing is just the math and you do not want your home to slow you down on your on your progression to FI. Uh, it should be somewhat comparable to what you would get renting and you should get some additional benefits, I would imagine, if you're doing that. And, and all that goes out the window when you try to get the biggest home that you can afford based on what the bank tells you. It's, it's just ridiculous. Uh, so it, that goes back to uh, Brad and I did this episode the other day about the the entry level middle class lifestyle that I believe that was, Brad, that was episode 20. The entry yes. level. Yeah, episode 20. And uh, we, we talked a little bit about what that looks like, but I am perfectly happy with the entry level middle class lifestyle because my primary goal is not to have a paid off McMansion, but it is to reach FI and fire. So, uh, you know, that's kind of my own personal analysis on it. Anything you want to add to that, Brad? Yeah. I mean, I, I think you hear commonly that, you know, home ownership is, you know, your, your biggest investment and, you know, the American dream and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, what we would say is it's just math. And for, for people like us, our home is not our biggest investment, you know, in all likelihood, it's our 401k balance or our, you know, whatever balance you have sitting there in Vanguard. So, you know, don't get thrown off by, you know, what popular culture says it's, it it comes down to math in most cases. And, you know, we're just asking you guys to be smart with, with what really is going to be the biggest line item in, in your budget. So, and one of the things that's really interesting about the show, this is everything that Brad and I think about on a regular basis about how we're going to get to five. I mean, we, we are going to get to five. Brad's probably, I would say probably two to three years ahead of me on this track, but he's going to be there very, very quickly. And I'm going to be there right on his coattails trying to get in right behind him. 
And these are the things that we're doing to get there. And if you kind of follow us and, and you buy into a few of these items that we're talking about, you're going to be there either before us or right there behind us. And so, you know, look at your housing, look at your investing techniques. And then that's the next one right behind housing has to be car ownership. And how much value do you place in the type of car you drive? So, Brad, how do we want to start with this one? All right. This is a, a perfect timing because we're actually going to have a real in-depth episode on car ownership and the the ultimate cost of car ownership next next Monday. So that'll be episode 22. So definitely stay tuned for that. So we don't want to you know waste too much time here on this. But but car ownership is another large line item that, you know, many people are, you know, a family is spending, I don't know, four hundred dollars a month per car. In, in many cases for a new car or, or a lease car. So, I mean, you're talking big bucks when, you know, it's $800 for two, a family with two cars. Plus, you know, then you throw in insurance and gas and all this stuff. I mean, you're well over $1,000 a month for, for many regular middle class families. And I mean, that is just crazy talk to me. We do not believe in buying new cars and we certainly don't believe in leasing cars. That is is really not a smart strategy at all. Uh, you know, in my perfect world, it's buy a very reliable used or, you know, lightly used car where all the the major depreciation has already come off of it. You know, let some other sucker pay for the first couple of years of depreciation and you reap the benefits of a car that could last for 15 or 20 years and, you know, really only have to have to deal with a tiny portion of the depreciation. So, you know, I know in my case, we did something similar with that with my wife's uh, Toyota Highlander. We bought it uh, four years used, but it actually only had 27,000 miles on it, which wow. was fantastic. And you know, we got it for basically half off what the current sticker price was at the time for a brand new Highlander. So literally 50% of the purchase price, it only had 27,000 miles on it. And we still have it. It's coming up on 10 years. And the thing is going strong. I, there's no reason to believe that it won't last forever at this point. And, uh, you know, I actually bought when I was, a you know, basically fresh out of college, bought a, a, a new car at the time. I, I didn't know quite as well, but it was a Honda Civic. It was only like fourteen or fifteen thousand dollars. And I I still have it, you know, 14 years later. So, uh, you know, that's that's how we do it with cars. And I think I think really the larger message is avoid new cars if at all possible. So Jonathan, throw it over to you for, for your thoughts. I am horrible with cars. I have, this has always been the bane of my, you know, financial life. I'm just so bad at it. But the, the conclusion that I've come to is, and I've always been, I've never actually purchased a brand new car in my life. So that's my little win in this. But I think like for me more and more, as I look at the math more and more, I'm just thinking, you know, if you can just be satisfied with that at least five-year-old car, that's got relatively low miles. Uh, it's already taken the depreciation hit that Brad talked about. Uh, and so you're just not throwing hundred dollar bills out the window every single week in depreciation. Those add up, those add up to real dollars over time. And so uh, I think, you know, more and more, the common theme that I've seen is get a, a gas sipper. That makes sense. We can all visualize gas cost, get a gas sipper. That's five years old. Uh, get one that, so it's gas sipper, meaning gets great gas mileage, get one that's easy to repair. So lots of old parts out there. If they were to actually need a repair, you're not going to, it's not an Audi. We're going to have to have something imported or a Land Rover or something crazy like that, where the, just the single part is going to cost you triple what it would in a, in a Honda. Um, and then, you know, for, because if you want the best of both worlds, get something with a fair amount of storage space. So like one of these Okano hatchbacks. So next week we're going to, we're going to actually do the true cost of car ownership, the ultimate guide to the true cost of car ownership. And we are going to go the, through the high level math. So big picture, what it's going to, what that will save you over a period of 20 to 40 years. And then low level, what is the cost of depreciation, maintenance, taxes? I mean, on, on an annual basis, what is your ch car choice actually costing you? And then with those two sets of information, you can then go and analyze it with your cars and you can figure out exactly how much you're losing, you know, based on your current setup. And then if you made a decision to switch to something else, you can pretty easily figure out what that might look like. And I think there's just a very, very fraction of people, very small fraction of people that actually win with cars, meaning they buy it at one price, they drive it for three years. And even after they take the, the, the small amount of depreciation, 
they end up selling it and making enough profit to offset some of their other cost. That is a rare breed and I am not one of them, but I can tell you average Joe Schmo that just goes out and buys something brand new off the street, you know, their car is probably costing them anywhere from seven to 10 grand a year. Just just realistically through, and, and we'll go through that math and take a look at it. But I mean, it can get really, really absurd uh, when you dig down into it. So that's going to be a really cool episode and it's helping me. So based on that episode that's coming up, um, I actually have kind of a game plan going forward so that even if I don't win, you know, with quotes, I at least, uh, I at least don't lose as badly. You know, cars are something that are going to cost you money if you make the decision. And you'll see after you go through that episode, why so many people talk about bikes. It really does make sense. Um, you know, whether or not that's feasible for everybody or not, you can at least understand from a math perspective how powerful riding a bike would be. All right, next. So that was pillar number three. So for pillar number four, we're going to take a look at the food budget. Brad and I talked about this. This was uh, episode seven, where we, congratulations, America, you're fat and broken. Also episode 10, where we did uh, skinny waist fat wallet, which was a look at frugal food and fitness. So uh, we really went into some depth there, but crushing your food bill is, is critical. And I think more and more I've come to just settle on, on Brad's magical number of uh, $2 per person per meal. Yeah. I mean, that, that has definitely worked for us as far as, you know, our approximate dinner cost and, you know, usually breakfast and lunch will be a little cheaper actually at that, but that's kind of like our, our guideline for dinner. And it was interesting that, uh, Jeremy from Go Curry Cracker had the exact same figure in his mind. And we, I actually also found it pretty cool that that he thought about it in the exact same terms. It was, you know, that per person per meal cost. And, you know, we've we've definitely talked about this before. Uh, you know, eating out is prohibitively expensive. It just is. I mean, when you you're talking about, you know, going to a restaurant, buying a ten dollar entree, buying, you know, a drink or even a, you know, a soda for a couple bucks or a beer for, you know, five or six bucks. And then you're, you know, in on tax and tip. I mean, it's, it's $20 plus per person. And, you know, in all likelihood, you're getting dramatically less healthy food to put it mildly. So yeah, as we said, you know, skinny waist, fat wallet by, by eating at home and, and saving money and just being a little bit smarter. So, uh, you know, it, just like a lot of stuff with Phi, it comes down to just thinking a little differently and being a little bit smarter. So, you know, if you have a game plan for your food and for your meals for the week, you know, sometimes it just takes a little bit of extra time. You know, this is kind of what we talked about with that that quote from the guy Jocko Willink, which is discipline equals freedom. So this is a perfect example. You know, it doesn't mean like discipline, like sit and study for 10 hours and, and work your tail off. And then you, you do well. It, it's not that it's, it's setting up a framework in life that makes your life dramatically easier. That's what discipline equals freedom is all about. And, you know, for, for us, this is a perfect example with our food, which is, you know, on the weekend, Laura sits down and plans out basically two meals that she's going to cook that week. Sometimes it's only one because, you know, it, she knows it's going to make a ton of leftovers. Oh, always she plans a meal to be to be two two nights. So it'll be, you know, she'll cook it on Monday, both of us will eat, and then we'll have it again on Wednesday. And then in all likelihood, there'll be another meal's worth of leftovers. That I had. So five person meals from one meal that she cooked. And I mean, that's that's fantastic. That's essentially three nights when Laura throws in her her one slice of pizza, you know, and then we have three nights from one time of her cooking. So, you know, that is an instance where discipline equals freedom. You sit down, you plan it out for 10 minutes and instead of scrambling every day and running to get fast food or running to get this or that, you just have it set. So it's cheaper dramatically. And it's much more psychologically satisfying that you just know, you know what your plan is. So you don't have to deal with those impulse buys, you know, when you go to the food store and see the $10 per person per meal prepared food, you just have it set. So yeah, Jonathan, what, what about you as far as food goes? So this is actually a great way for me to announce that I came to the end of that program and I went from 198 pounds down to, um, 173 pounds. I think now I'm back up to 175 ish. So I did drop, uh, 25 pounds. Pounds didn't quite hit my 30. I'm wow. sorry, guys. Uh, reality hit me at some point. And uh, I think part of it was I went up to the uh, it's always good to have an excuse lined up when you don't totally hit your goals. Okay. You know, <laughs> that's a great <laughs> life hack tip right there. Just have one or two, you know, teed up just in case you need them. But uh, when we went to two 
days a week publishing, it really cut down on my exercise. Now, I didn't get as much exercise in, but I crushed it on the diet perspective. I didn't cheat. I think I cheated one time the entire 12 weeks, which is unheard of for me. And uh, I stuck with the one fast day a week. I told you I was going to do that. I got really good at going to bed on an empty stomach. And I that one day a week, I just did a total fast. And yeah, I mean, I was dropping one to two pounds. Occasionally, went up to three pounds a week. Um, there were some weeks where I didn't lose any, you know, that were kind of mixed in there. Uh, and it was fantastic. And a couple things happened as I was doing that. I One, I uh, kind of just reprogrammed my brain to get in touch with the foods I was eating again. So I started noticing extraordinarily different levels of energy just based on the breakfast I had. Whereas when I was just eating whatever I wanted all the time, you kind of lose that. You just kind of feel like garbage all the time. But after 12 weeks of really eating very clean, high quality foods, you know, you just feel alert. You feel mentally awake. Occasionally you'd have cravings, but they are very controllable. Uh, and then when I would screw it up, like the other day, I had some Cheetos the other day for the first time and I just felt horrible. And it just kind of tells you, you know, your body gets used to these different types of garbage food and accepts it but it just slows you down more and more. And if you get back and you're just eating this clean, high quality food, especially over a period of like 12 weeks, it really does make an extraordinary difference in your energy levels uh, and how alert you are, just your overall satisfaction. You get enjoyment out of a lot of things. So overall, it was it was an incredible success. 25 pounds, 12 weeks. Uh, I decided I'm just going to keep on going because it's really not that difficult. I think I'm just going to kind of keep on doing it. And essentially, it's not really adding a whole lot to my life. I really didn't exercise very much at all. I didn't run a single time. <laughs> I stopped altogether about halfway through. Um, I really even stopped walking for the most part just because my life got so busy with work and, and, and other stuff and this podcast probably in particular particularly. And then the one thing I did is I stole Brad's goal with the pull-ups and I got my pull-ups up to 50 pull-ups. So how yeah. many pull-ups? Yeah, <laughs> I crushed it. <laughs> I can do 50 pull-ups now in one set. Yeah, man. Yep. Wow. I took your goal and ran with it. That's amazing. Yeah. I was always pretty good at them, but uh, when I heard you say 15 and then I, it ended up being like my one exercise that I actually do. So I'd literally get home shirt and tie from work about to go to bed. You know, let me go and do one set of pull-ups to be the only physical exercise I'm going to get today. And I probably started with a baseline of like 12 to 15, somewhere in that range. And yeah, just kept on pushing it. So I'm up to 50 now. That was my, that was my win right there. But, uh, overall I feel great, man. Feel absolutely fantastic. And I think I'm just going to keep on going. If I lose like one pound a week for the next, you know, several weeks, I'll be very satisfied with this. So nice. Yeah. That's incredible progress. 25 pounds in 12 weeks. So good work. And obviously you saved a whole boatload of money over what, you know, the regular middle-class Joe Schmo is doing. So yeah, good for you. Yeah. I didn't, I don't think I, I, don't, I think I went out to eat one time at Chipotle over that 12 week period. And I really didn't feel like I missed anything either. So uh, we'll do some cookouts in the spring. You know, I, I do love actually cooking really good foods, but I'm really in it for the social component, which works so well with, with, the Phi space. I mean, Phi is all about community. It's all about building these relationships. And instead of moving something just from a restaurant where you're just going through the motions and actually making it a community-based thing, maybe you're doing a, a barbecue in the backyard. That's where that's where I get the most enjoyment out of. So kind of frugal analogs there. Anyways, that was off topic, but you guys deserved it. I know I had told you about it um, back in February and March, and we're obviously at the end now. So that's, that's where I'm at. And uh, yeah. So thanks for all y'all's support and questions, and we'll just keep going from here. Pillar number five, tax optimization. I think this is, of everything we do, this is the sexiest thing, which only in the fire community would you call tax optimization sexy, but it really is the the coolest thing that, that we uh, dig down and, and break down for people. And there's so many techniques that our community has figured out that nobody outside of this space was talking about. Like, you're never going to hear Dave Ramsey talking about capital gains harvesting. You're never going to hear him talk about the Roth conversion ladder. You're just not going to get the stuff on Susie Orman. Uh, but in the fire community, we have these really cool advanced techniques to, to never pay taxes again. And I'm just looking at our episodes and we have done so many on them now. So we started with uh, 17, which was Mad Scientist, where we really went through the Roth conversion ladder. And then in episode 18 with uh, Go Curry Cracker, we went through uh, capital gains and losses and specifically harvesting those. And then upcoming, we're going to be going into some real depth with wealthy accountant taking a look at just crushing it on all sorts of other little deductions and special techniques that you can use that and he's already got them all listed over in his blog we're going to try and turn those into a story on our podcast i'm really excited about that so and then in our friday roundups we went into even more depth so if you want more information on how you can use the roth conversion ladder or how you can use capital gains harvesting two incredibly powerful techniques that you can use to never pay taxes again especially in your fi life that's already been set up for you so one of the things that we do is we use the podcast to get this information turned into a story. And while you could certainly listen to our podcast 
starting from episode one, marathoning it and coming now to episode 22 or 23. And you'll be very happy with the story that that tells. You know, a year from now, this information is still going to be here and there's going to be a lot more added on to it. And so when you're ready to start taking the specific class on crushing your taxes, you can go to choosefi.com and you can go specifically to our tax optimization page and you can dig through all of those content, all that content individually on an as needed basis. It's going to be there for you. That's the idea. Take all of this stuff, find it, collate it, put it together in a place that makes sense and that you can grab it and apply it to your life on an as needed basis. And when we've designed this webpage, that's how we designed it to, to really set that up and make it easy to find. And yeah, just final word for me on, on the tax optimization standpoint is, you know, uh, Jonathan is one of the, one of the big episodes we had was with millionaire educator actually on, on tax optimization. And really the biggest key and the biggest takeaway is to max out all of your tax deferred accounts. So your 401k, if you're a public employee and you have a 403b, 457, your IRAs, you know, we want to, as Jonathan said, we want to never pay taxes again. And we think that using some of these advanced strategies, like the Roth IRA conversion ladder and the capital gain harvesting that, that we can effectively really outsmart the system. And that's, that's what FI is, is all about to some degree. It's, it's about knowing the rules and maximizing them as much as possible. So, you know, whereas the conventional wisdom is max out your Roth IRA, right? That's what you hear all the time. That is not the general advice from the FI community. It's max out the tax deferred accounts because we think you can get that money out on the back end without paying any tax on it at all, or at the most, a very, very small amount. So you can literally never pay taxes on that money, period. So locking yourself into a Roth IRA now and paying the taxes now is not good advice for the FI community. So, you know, again, that's just just looking at a problem a little bit differently. That's awesome. I'm glad you rounded that out. And honestly, Millionaire Educator, to me, he is one of my all-time favorite episodes because he is the first person that got me thinking about taxes differently. I mean, he crystallized the concept of creating these buckets and then filling these buckets and treating it as a game. How can you live your life within these margins that have been set up uh, by our federal government? But if you can do it inside those, those, those buckets, inside those brackets, then it just gives you all this other freedom. And so the story he tells with that episode transformed the way I will forever look at taxes. I'm not saying it was the final note on that, but if you implement the tools that he talked about in that episode, and I think that's episode 13, the unfair FI advantage of teachers, if you take that episode and use that as a starting place, all these other tools become available to you. It really is the just the, one of the perfect episodes to start with. Okay, guys, pillar number six, we think that's college hacking. Um, we realize that some of you already already passed that point, but it still affects you because you're probably gonna have kids at some point. And for those of you that are listening to this earlier, then maybe you still have time to implement it. But in general, college hacking, this is being focused at the parents for the kids. This is a second generation fire conversation. Brad and I are gonna patent that. I don't think anybody has second generation generationfire.com. If they do, you just got a free plug. But second generation fire is the future. I mean, can you imagine that child starting at the age of 18 with these tools under his belt, maybe graduating college debt free, you know, maybe the parent implementing all these tax optimization strategies for them, teaching them how it works, giving them these tools when they go into their 20s. I mean, you learning this in your 30s is powerful. You learning this in your 40s, 50s, 60s is powerful. It can change your life. But if you have learned it in your teens, if you're a parent and you're teaching your kids this stuff, this is a game changer. Any single one of these is a game changer. But together, you know, with great power becomes great. It comes great responsibility, right? These are superpowers when you apply them to a 20 year old. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And what's funny, the second generation fire, I actually got an email from Jim Collins yesterday. I didn't tell you this, Jonathan. Uh, he was listening to a bunch of our old po podcasts and he literally wrote an email that just said second generation fire. Great line. Love it. So that was that was really cool. I know you uh, you coined that phrase. So, you know, a little uh, kudos to you there. Uh, yeah, thanks. But <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely setting someone up. Someone has probably already reserved that domain name after listening to it at this point. And I've definitely set you up for success. Um, but yeah, enjoy. But yeah, you know, as far as as college hacking goes, you know, this is something we're going to talk about certainly in great detail over the next you know year or years because because it is such a line a big line item in people's budgets and you know we had an article on dual enrollment where you can start earning college credits in in high school and really you know cut the number of years that you have to to actually go to a four year college there are ways to you know go do something unconventional you know not 
go to the best college you can get into, but you know, go places where you can get scholarships or, or even better, go to a community college for two years and then, you know, make sure again, you know, the rules that's, you know, we always come back to these pillars, right? Which is what we're talking about here, which is knowing the rules and maximizing them, right? So if, if you know for certain that your child can go to X community college, you know, around the corner from you and can take all these courses and have them transferred to a top tier public university in your state. Well, I mean, that's going to save you essentially two years worth of college. I mean, because community college is, is extraordinarily inexpensive. Then we have Sun Wu Lee coming out with his article on hacking the FAFSA, which we're going to detail in depth here. So, I mean, there are ways, especially for people in the FI community who eventually, who once they're in FI, don't quote unquote have a lot of income, right? We have a lot of assets, but not a, a huge amount of incoming income. Well, there are ways that, that we believe that you can hack college aid and potentially get any college for free or pretty close to free. So this is this is a real big item, and that's why we included it in the pillars of FI. And that financial freedom clock starts when you hit zero. And the thing that keeps people from getting to zero faster is the student debt. So that's why this is such a big play. Let's let our next generation. Let's try to get them to the point where they are they are starting from broke or starting from zero. You know, in their teens instead of in their thirties. So, anyways, enough said there. That's one of those we'll constantly be coming back to. Uh, if you want more information on that, you can check out our episode, I believe it's 15 with uh, Justin from Root of Good, also called Second Generation Fire. And then we went, we had a featured article by Edmund T. That is under our college hacking uh page on our website. You can check that out where he talks about how he saved his son two years of his life and $18,000 by focusing on dual enrollment. And then to come soon will be that college hacking, or I'm sorry, the FAFSA hacking tutorial by uh, Sun Wu. And we'll let y'all know when he releases that. Okay. Pillar number seven. Now this is one that is very unique to the FI community. And in fact, I think it's what puts us at odds with, you know, the Dave Ramsey crowd. And this is the joy we get from travel rewards, the pure joy that we get from traveling the world for free. (laughs) So you have this entire army of people and maybe rightly, maybe rightly so they say that credit cards are the devil and you should cut them up and they are, and they are ruining lives. And you know, actually, that's probably true. I don't really take issue with that. That 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 is true. They are dangerous. But our audience is a different audience. We're already doing all the math on everything. We're already for other reasons, not because we, we don't we we have the self control. We've demonstrated that we're pursuing other things. We're not just purchasing stuff just to purchase it. We're already talking about what's the value of something and how is this holding me from getting back to my financial future. And so, once you're debt free and living. F- far below your income, all that stuff about credit cards goes out the window. And now we can actually start to look at credit cards as a tool that we can use to literally travel the world for free. And it's a completely different conversation. So Dave Ramsey can be 100% right and 100% wrong at the same time, depending on the audience that he's talking to. Many people need to cut up their credit cards. I don't deny that. I know who those people are. I probably would be in danger of being one of those people at some point in my life if I didn't see what the other side looked like. But I'm pursuing FI and I organize my life in a way to make FI possible. Possible. And in that construct that I've created, credit cards are a tool that I can use to literally take my wife to Italy for free next year if I want and spend a week there, you know, and I don't have to spend anything extra for it. It is a way that I can go and visit my in-laws in Zimbabwe and Africa. I can go to Cape Town. It's a way that I can take my family afford to Disney World for free. It, it turns something that could otherwise be stressful into a game that I can play and I can only do it because I'm in the fire community and because I know these tools. I know about these life hacks that allow me to do that, allow me to leverage it. And that's something that honestly, that's something that Brad taught me. He was the one that finally got me in on this, on this fun game. And so I'll be ever, I'll forever be grateful to him for that. And at the same time, I'm incredibly excited that that's something that now we can share with you, our audience, and that y'all can benefit from it as well. Yeah. And that's how we met actually, right? You heard me on the Mad Finances podcast and realized I was in Richmond and yeah, we met up for a a burger for lunch and you know, the rest is history. Now we have this podcast. So that's a pretty, pretty cool backstory, you know? Yeah. But you're unquestionably right. I mean, Dave Ramsey, you know, his advice honestly is good for many more people than our advice is good for in 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 this realm of credit cards credit cards are dangerous for many people but for people who are listening to this and people who are pursuing fi jonathan is exactly right i mean we are are clearly beyond those you know day-to-day month-to-month concerns of not paying our credit card right so that's that's like the the very first rule of pursuing travel rewards points is 
do you pay your credit card on time and in full every month? If you do, which I'm sure all of you out there do, then you know this is something that can really juice your your credit card rewards from like the normal like piddly little 1% to 15, 20, 30%. I mean, that's that's essentially a rebate on every dollar you're spending in life that you funnel onto your credit card. I mean, when you think about it like that, that is a very powerful concept. So that is why we we include travel rewards in our pillars of FI. All right, pillar number eight, cut the cord. And I love this one because this is one that Brad hasn't done yet. I'm working on him. He's, he's going to do it soon, hopefully. But <laughs> cut the gable cord. You know, this is a, a generation that, you know, you're living in a time where there are a million ways to get your necessary needed information, such as quote unquote news, and also uh, a way for you to get your entertainment that does not involve paying $150 a month to a cable company uh, for the privilege of them pumping commercials into your home all day long. And if you can just immediately chop $150 a month from your budget just by getting rid of the garbage that's being pumped onto your TV, then you should do it. You know, take control of the the media that's being that's in your home. And instead of watching whatever comes on the TV, you know, watch what you actually want to a la carte via, you know, channels such as Netflix or, you know, Amazon Prime or Hulu or any number of things like the Roku. Watch what you want to watch. Don't pay for everything just to get that tiny little fraction. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's an awesome play. And I think that everyone should consider whether or not that's something that they can do. And it makes a big impact over your 20 or 30 year investing financial outlook. You know, it's, it's kind of one of the ones that we put at the end because it seems like a small thing, but it's always, it's the small things when you add them together that add up. So number, number eight, cut the cord. Yeah, totally agreed. And yeah, again, this is, while it sounds like small fries, you know, as far as actual dollar figures, you know, it's still in most cases a hundred dollars a month. And when added up over years and decades and compounded that those are big, big dollars. So, and it's also like a larger look at life, which is, you know, as Jonathan kind of alluded to, like, don't just sit back passively and, you know, sit on a couch for hours a day and do nothing like that. That's not what our lives are about. So why would we spend our resources on expensive cable packages? It just doesn't make any sense. And, you know, just just to kind of uh, jokingly follow up to what Jonathan said, we essentially did try to cut the cord and we're basically paying now like twenty five dollars a month for uh what the cable company threw at us, which is a pretty significant <laughs> stuff. So I don't feel I don't feel too bad about it at this point. You're saying after uh, our episode, you called them up after our episode. I looked into it a little little further and realized that I was not paying quite as much as I okay. as I thought I was honestly, and that, you know, what they're giving us is, was a value judgment for, you know, oh, 25 bucks a month is great. And does that include that we your thought it was well? worthwhile? You know, because the funny thing was we actually went to them with the intention originally of cutting the cord. That was our intention. And, you know, we realized that, as you said, like the, the internet package was either 45 or $50 a month. And, you know, they gave us this ridiculous, ridiculous package for just under $80 a month for, you know, all in. So that was something we determined, especially with our kids and, yeah. and you know, that, that it made sense to spend that, you know, sub $30 on, on that cable. But, you know, it's something that we are definitely going to contemplate cutting at, at some point in the future, just because we really don't watch that much TV. So once right. our kids get a little bit older, it'll, that'll go, but, but at least it was intentional. And I think, and I think from the larger standpoint, like that intentionality is, is what's so important about FI and like how we value our money, right? Like everyone values their money differently and chooses to spend it in different ways. But as long as it's intentional and there's some thought behind it, that that's okay with me. So that that's where I come from. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. All right. And then fi- uh, well, not finally, but number nine. Uh, pillar number nine, cheap cell phones. Yeah, this is this is very similar to number eight. And I guess, you know, we <laughs> theoretically could have packaged it together with with number eight. But it but it, it's cool that you that you separated it because, you know, I think a lot of people do just spend a, a ton of money on their cell phones. I mean, I know, you know, what what's normal for a couple, Jonathan, like one hundred and fifty, two hundred dollars a month. Definitely. Is that I mean, is yeah, that reasonable for sure? And, you know, and again, it's 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 just not thinking differently or, or making those tiny little hard choices that are going to give you disproportionate benefit. And and this is this is why I like this actually as a standalone pillar personally is is because it, it illustrates that. Right. So you can get 
unlimited data and just, you know, stream movies from, you know, your car going down the highway, like, you know, do all sorts of, you know, wacky stuff because, hey, you have a cell phone, you deserve it, right? Like that, you know, said sarcastically, right? Like that's, that's just the normal American mantra is, hey, I pay for it. I'll, I'll pay for whatever I need to get every little bit of access. And, you know, I choose to look at cell phones in particular just as as that hard choice that makes for an easy life. So, I mean, my cell phone bill is about, depending on the month, 12 to $16 a month. And that's through Republic Wireless. And, you know, I use it more than I feel like I should. Like I, I check my Facebook and check email and, and all this other stuff, you know, when I'm, when I'm out of the house and it just doesn't amount to that much data because I'm smart about it. I'm not streaming videos when I'm out. I'm just doing the tiny little thing that makes a tiny, tiny little hard choice, but that saves me 90% on my cell phone bill. So for me, that's a, that's a decision that's well worth making. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Okay, so pillar number 10. Uh, pillar number 10 is probably the most important out of all of these pillars, and it's the one that we're going to go into the least detail about, partially for the sake of time and partially because when we do go into depth, we want to make sure we do it the right way. This is one that most of these other budgeting type pillars are based on, and that is the 4% rule. Brad, do you want to just introduce that concept for us? Sure. So the 4% rule, as Jonathan said, is is really the the underpinning of the entire concept of financial independence. It's helps us calculate the amount of money we need to save in our total net worth between our retirement accounts and our taxable investments. So ultimately what the concept is, and as Jonathan mentioned, this is far, far beyond the confines of of one pillar here. So we're going to do a very in-depth episode on this. But the concept is you can withdraw 4% of your total funds every single year as a, quote, safe withdrawal rate. And what that means, so your money Money, as we've always assumed, and this is, of course, a very, very broad generalization, but your money is going to grow at an approximate rate of 8% compounded annually. And if you can withdraw 4% of your total assets every single year to live off of, in theory, that money will last forever. It will last in perpetuity. And there are lots of articles on this. We're going to link to a couple of these in the show notes from Go Curry Cracker and from uh, JL Collins and Mr. Money Mustache. And evidently, there was a, a study done called the Trinity Study. And they looked at 84 year study period and the possible retirement periods and the percentage success rate after 30 years during this this study. So they looked at essentially every single option and they did, uh, there's a great table here in the Go Curry Cracker article that I'm looking at now. Uh, They have a different section with if you had 100% stocks, if you had 75% stocks, 25% bonds, 50-50, 25 stocks, 75 bonds, and 100% bonds. So essentially I'm looking here at the 4% withdrawal column. And if you had 100% stocks, there is a 98% chance that money will last you 30 years if you withdraw 4%. There's a 100% chance that if you had 75% stocks and 25% bonds, which is interestingly, that's what Jim Collins mentioned is his allocation. So that is 100% likelihood of that money lasting you 30 years. Uh, And you you can see this schedule here on on the article and we will link to it in the show notes. So that's really the concept. When when we talk about, you know, what is your FI number? It's your annual expenses multiplied by 25. It's as simple as that. And that covers the the 4% rule. So uh, you know, just looking at the math, it's, you know, it's multiplied or divided essentially. So if you had a million dollars multiplied that by 4%, that is $40,000. Okay. So that's your, that's the amount you would need to live on and turned around mathematically. It's 40,000 multiplied by 25 is the same million dollars. So, uh, you know, that's the number that we're looking at. Uh, you know, honestly, like some people might not be a hundred percent comfortable with that. As I've mentioned, you know, many, many times on the podcast, I'm a little more concerned conservative with my money. I, you know, I wouldn't up and retire or up and consider myself financially independent the second I hit 
4%. For me, I would probably be a little bit on the conservative side, you know, three and a half percent, even 3% withdrawal. And, you know, that then is going to make it as close to a certainty as humanly possible that that's going to last me forever. So that's something I feel comfortable with. Uh, but, you know, to each his own, obviously. It's, you know, the math says there's a real high likelihood, you know, to the tune of 98 to 100 percent that this money is going to last you for 30 years based on on the Trinity study. So, uh, Jonathan, I'll throw it over to you for any thoughts. Yeah, I've been itching to take a stab at this one. Uh, first of all, there's another word that we use for the 4 percent rule. It's sometimes called the safe withdrawal rate. That's, that's just another way that we frame it. But it's a maximum rate at which you can spend your retirement savings so that you don't run out within your lifetime. Now, whether or not the safe withdrawal rate is 3 percent or 4 percent, or 2%, you know, for the sake of this particular conversation, it doesn't really matter. I feel pretty comfortable with the 4% rate, at least as a place to start. But what I love about having a number that you can work with when you're doing a case study is that you actually do have a realistic place that you can start. So, you know, people say, well, how much do you need to retire? And then people out in the regular, you know, average Joe will say, oh, $2 million, $5 million, $10 million, $600,000. Like, what is that based on? It's not based on anything. And until I heard about the the 4% rule or the safe withdrawal, rate. That was just kind of, you know, what I felt comfortable with. It was just saying a random number and hoping that that was a good one, you know, know it without really knowing anything else. But this gives you a great framework. So when Brad and I do these case studies um, going forward, or we send these case studies off to other people to do to announce on the show. So like you send us what you would like for us to do as a case study and we start working on it. This is where we start. And then we can bend the curve up or down depending on what we want to do. But if you calculate your expenses out and it costs you your fixed expenses plus discretionary comes to 40 grand, then, you know, that gives us a real easy number. We need to multiply that times 25 and we're at a million. You know, conversely, if you're at, you know, 80 grand or 90 grand, that also gives us something that we can work on as well. And so that is the simplicity and the beauty of the 4% rule. The 3%, the 2% rule and all that other jazz, the math isn't quite as clean, right? It's just not as fun to work with. It doesn't mean it's wrong, but just for the sake of having a, a common baseline that we can start from, I love the 4% rule. And it's what Brad and I use when we're, you know, running through our own personal case studies and when we're doing other people's. From there, you make adjustments, right, Brad? Yep, without a doubt. And, and, you really touched on the most important point, which is it's all about your expenses. Nothing really, essentially nothing else matters. If you can keep those expenses under control, then financial independence looks a whole lot easier, right? At $30,000 a year of expenses, it's only $750,000 that you have to save up, which, you know, sounds like a big number in theory. But as we've discussed on many of our case studies on these, on our Friday roundups, you can amass that fairly quickly. You know, the at 10 to 15 years, you know, based on a decent amount of savings, obviously. But but it's very, very plausible. So it's all about keeping those expenses under control. And uh, yeah, I mean, this uh, hopefully was a good overview of, of the 4% rule. So then, the, so those are our 10 pillars, guys. I love those. I'm not necessarily saying that they are perfect, that there's not some room for some, you know, honest discussion and some disagreement. I think you could maybe say travel hacking. Come on, guys. But guys, this is the FI community. We get to make the rules. And in the FI community, we we freaking love travel hacking. So it's a pillar for us. You see it all across the board. Look at every single FI blogger that's out there. They're comfortable with this. We enjoy it. We enjoy talking about it. So I think it's reasonable to include it. And even if you're thinking to yourself, well, I don't know if I'm going to do that. The, the, the logic and the principles behind it where where we game everything out and we look for wins where other people are hemorrhaging money. We look for ways to win. I think that that, that is essentially where our mindsets are at. And we put that particular you know philosophy into everything else we do. So what is the philosophy? Brad, do you want to go and tackle that? How can we take all of those different pillars and turn all of that into one singular philosophy? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, this is something if, if, you know, people out there in the audience have been listening to us over these, you know, 20 some odd podcasts, they know that, that I really try to take a step back and, and look at this as a life philosophy. And I, I think it's so important. And, you know, I think there are a couple of things that jump out to me right away, which is that, you know, the first is, is unconventional thinking. And we've talked about this all throughout the, ep this particular episode and, and prior episodes, it's, it's just thinking a little bit differently than the next guy, you know, just looking at, at spending and at, and at life as just like a, a problem to solve with, with smart thinking. And like that to me is just so satisfying. It's living that same middle-class lifestyle as everybody else, but getting wealthy while doing it and while everybody else is living paycheck to paycheck. So, I mean, like, that's just such a cool thing. And like, you know, I think like, I like to think about like my neighbors, you know, my neighbors would never ever in a million years know that we were any different or that we were saving, you know, 50 to 75% of our income while everybody else is living paycheck to paycheck. They just want to know because we look like every other family, right? But it's just these, these few 
unconventional choices that that add up over over the monthly budget and over the yearly budget and and compound it over decades. And that's that's what it's the, you know the biggest thing. You know, like we've talked about many times, Jonathan is is maximizing the rules, right? It's it's just knowing the rules again, being a little bit smarter and just intentional, right? And, you know, we've talked about this in many instances, like, you know, potentially the the college hacking down the road is if I can get college for free or pretty close to free for my two daughters, just by knowing the rules and thinking about it 10 years in advance, that's something I'm absolutely thrilled about. And, you know, most people, unfortunately, are have a tough time, you know, just getting through the day, right? Just regular, regular people are just worried about, what they're going to put on the table for dinner that night or, you know, when they're going to have time to do the laundry or something, you know, minuscule like that. And, and that, again, comes back to, you know, just not planning. Right. And it's it's just being a little bit smarter, like not worrying about the mundane stuff, but worrying about trying to to figure out life a little bit better. And maximizing the rules is is really one of one of those main, main pillars in, in my estimation. And, you know, my final thing, and I'll throw it over to Jonathan for his thoughts, is is really patience. You know, Jonathan kind of alluded to this in in his intro, which, you know, kind of saying like that Phi is easy but incredibly difficult. And, you know, I, like my take on that is there's nothing incredibly difficult about this, but I think he hit on something essential, which is this is this is not it, this is incredibly difficult for most people because they don't have the patience to think about life more than you know this week right we in the five community look at this as a 10 to 20 year journey to reach financial independence true financial independence where we control our lives for the forthcoming decades multiple multiple decades and that's that's long-term thinking that that unfortunately most people just don't have the ability to do or, or it just hasn't crossed their plate, you know, but hopefully everybody out there listening to this knows this is not a short thing. This is not a quick fix. This is if you can be smart over a period of 10, 15, 20 years, you can take control of your entire life. So uh, that's that's my final word on the pillars of Phi. And Jonathan, I'd love to hear what what your closing thoughts are. Yeah. Okay. So mine is, these are all such, you know, some of them may have seemed larger, some of them may have seemed smaller, but why do the small ones matter? Um, the, the reason is because these are going to be implemented consistently over the next 20 years for you. So basically the easiest way to look at it for every hundred dollars that you can slice from your, from your budget, from, from the end of your budget each month. So, you know, when we talk about going from $150 down to $50 a month on your cell phone bill, that's a just, that's a hundred dollars a month that you've just saved right there over 20 years. You know, if you invest the difference and that's the key, when, whenever we talk about you finding a way to reduce the cost of your lifestyle, usually the difference is not being spent on frivolous stuff. That's a way for us to increase our savings rate and to get it back into pillar number one, which was low cost index fund investing. Now you could make the play and, and put it into a side hustle. You know, you could maybe start a rental real estate business. You start a side hustle, but assuming that you're just focused on low cost index fund investing, that's good enough. That's that's more than good enough. That's that's probably one of your best options for the guaranteed path to wealth. For every hundred dollars a month that you cut from your budget. That's going to be $60,000 in 20 years. And not only is that $60,000 that you're going to have, but you're going to need $1,200 a year less in expenses. I mean, that's, that's the double, that's, that's, that's the double power of you slashing that from your budget. So we just went through 10 things. Now, some of those, every single one of those will save you a minimum of a hundred dollars a month. So that's $60,000, you know, at the end of that 20 year period each individual once, but some of those are worth way more than that. Not starting out with $40,000 worth of debt, that's probably a multiple hundred thousand dollar decision right there. Getting an affordable housing instead of the, the, the McMansion, that's gonna be a million dollar decision right there. Every single one of those adds up to a number that's almost incomprehensible. So our final thing is just math everything, right? Just understand the math and then make the value choice. And the small decisions matter too. Those ones at the end, they do make a difference. And so that's just a nice little general rule of thumb. If you can slash $100 a month from your budget and you invest the difference 20 years later, that's 60 grand. It's a big deal. The small stuff does matter. 
So anyways, I hope that y'all enjoyed this. Um, this is a high level stuff. If you want more information about any one of those levers that we talked about, we have started to really dive into it and we made a, a special effort to tell you what episode that was in. So depending on where you're at on this journey, you should consider going back to those other episodes. And we talked more about the uh, cell phone on episode 20 and also the cable on episode 20. And then one other thing that we didn't mention today was insurance. Uh, we also talked a little bit about that in episode 20, and we're going to have another episode coming up in the somewhat near future about it as well. So th- that's it. Those are the pillars of five and, and all those small details matter. And if you implement them just one at a time, you don't have to do everything tomorrow, but if you do them one at a time, you are going to retire incredibly wealthy and you're going to retire decades in front of your peers. So I hope that you enjoyed this and we'll see you next week as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.